welcome to another episode of the Beyond Sport podcast, the podcast that talks about careers, sport, mental health, and everything in between. You have myself as one of the usual hosts, Craig, with fellow tutor Nathan. Unfortunately, we don't have Mark here with us today, uh, but we do have uh, his college representative and host, Aidan Griffiths, and I'm delighted to welcome along Lewis Reeves. Hello, Lewis. Welcome. All right. How are we doing? Thank you. So now uh, some of you might notice Lewis, some of you might not recognise him. I'm going to tell you a little bit about him. So um, he's an actor, a writer, director now, kind of done a bit of everything within uh, theatre and, and, and TV production stuff. Most of our younger audience will probably re- recognise uh, his voice, especially uh, from the FIFA 17 and 18 games, and which we'll chat about as well. That's but, actually that post in the background there. No, perfect. There you go. Product placement. Yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, I want to kind of start, Lewis, if we can, by kind of going all the way back to how you first kind of got into acting and was it something that you always wanted to do? Um, honestly, no, I don't, I don't think so. So I'm the eldest of three boys uh, and generally growing up, it was just me and my brother Joel and Callum. And when you've got three lads fighting for one lady's attention we were constantly sort of like performing or like pulling, you know, jokes on one another, trying to top each other constantly. And I think coming from trying to entertain her um, and make her laugh all the time, I think that that was literally the natural, the natural right. progression. Um, I always say to people, like we used to do martial arts all the time. We used to do Taekwondo down at where you was now, like I think the French gate centers extended, but we used to go to just by this opposite the station at Kim Stone's uh, Academy. Uh, we'd go like about five, six times a week. And we absolutely loved it. And we progressed through all our, all our belts. Um, but I was just rubbish at fighting. I was just so bad, but I really loved the, the movement aspect. And then that led on to like to dance. And then I sort of, it sort of, played around with that, did I want to become a dancer, did a bit of training. And then I realized I was equally as bad at dancing as I was at fighting. <laughs> um, and then that sort of progressed through to acting and that's sort of where I, I sort of found myself. But that wasn't until I was about maybe 16, 17, really. So quite a later date. And then once that sort of bit me, um, I was like, oh, this is this is what I want to do. Nice. So you attended the the... Royal Welsh School of Music and Drama. A yeah. lot of our a lot of our students are, are reaching a point now where they're going to be progressing on and moving to different areas in the country and, and starting a new life. And obviously it's a big step. How did you cope mentally with that? Um, well, I think I probably set myself upright. So going to drama school, I mean, historically it's quite an elitist thing. And it, we, we sort of associate it with like, you know, the, the upper classes and to, it to be quite a, a luxury. So I took, I mean, even to audition for drama school, it costs like 50 quid an audition. So it, my, my sort of financial status, especially at that time, I knew I was going to have to take a year out, not to go like traveling or anything like that, which I really, really wanted to do. Um, but that was just going to be to save up for drama school. So I think mentally, I think ever since I made that decision, I was really driven. Um, uh, and I knew that that was what I wanted to do. And my mum always sort of supported me. So I, in that sense, I was really, um, really privileged. Um, so I, I suppose my piece of advice for anyone sort of, you know, around that age, thinking about going on to uni or higher education is, You've got so much time. It might not seem like it at the time. You're like, you know, your friends might be going off and doing this, that, and the other. Um, but you, you do have so much time. I, I didn't go till I was 21. And um, but by the time you know, I'd you know saved up money and got myself there, I knew that that was what I really wanted to do. So those days when yeah, I'm skin, um, you know, it's tough. The training is is incredibly sort of mentally and physically demanding. But I knew it was what I wanted to do. And I had a really good, I was fortunate enough to have a good sort of setup at home. So that, you know, I took a lot of comfort in that. 
Um, so kind of moving on from that, then you, you kind of made your, your breakthrough into kind of acting and in, in, into kind of the West End, which obviously where a lot of kind of people um, follow up from them, from them kind of footsteps. It must have been quite inspiring kind of being in them kind of big theatres and stuff like that, where so many great actors and actresses have been before. Oh my God, yeah, it was amazing. Um, first time around, I was like, oh, I'm in the West End, this is amazing. And it was a crazy time because we were doing a play called Our Boys. Um, and a couple of the lads in that, you had uh, Matthew Lewis, who played Neville Longbottom. So you had a huge Harry Potter fan base. You had Arthur Darville, who had uh, Doctor Who sort of fan base. So huge, crazy fan bases. It felt like we were the Beatles. Like it's staged or it was absolutely, like, but they, you know, everyone else had come out and then, I, I, then I'd come out and be like, who's that? Um, <laughs> so it was kind of like um, a really weird uh, baptism of fire for that to be one of my first jobs. I think it sort of set me up a little bit, like not every job's like that, mate. Do you know what I mean? So I think I was like, oh, bloody hell, here I go. I'm going to be Ryan Gosling. And then, you know, a couple of months later, once I'd finished the play, play I was like, Oh right, yeah, this is um, this is real. Like, I better go get a job as a waiter for a bit then. <laughs> so it was a real, it was a real, it was a really interesting time. I absolutely loved it. So by the time I came to do West End again a couple of years later, I was a bit more grounded. I was a bit more ready for it. it was uh, first time was just like, I mean, I absolutely loved it. You know, I treated treat with respect, but I think uh, looking back. I'd have probably done a few things a little, a little more different now, but you know, we learn that with age, don't we? Very true. And and kind of, I think Aidan, that kind of leads into your kind of question in terms of where it went next. So. Yeah, I'm the average teenager. I love playing football. And I can speak on behalf of every other teenager who likes playing football that I jump at the chance to be involved in a game like FIFA. So, how did you get yourself into an opportunity to be able to be in a game as big as FIFA? Um, well, it sort of came through the usual channels. A lot of people, you know, the sort of uh, the way it's sort of laid out, you go to drama school, you do your training, and then from that, you do a showcase, and that hopefully leads on to where you get an agent where someone will represent you and then they'll put you up for auditions and jobs. Um, so that's the short way of saying it. It's a, ve it's a very long process, basically. Being, I mean, some people are really lucky as well, you know. They, you know, you might get scouted or they might do a bit of modelling or, you know, the way, especially castings going nowadays, they like to get people, like sort of like yourself, Aidan, like a group of lads on a football pitch, they might try and say, look, do you want to come do this reading for a show that we're doing? So there's loads of different avenues, but my avenue was going to drama school, getting an agent, and then they presented me with a job. But at first it was so top secret. Like it wasn't even, it didn't say FIFA or anything like that. It was just like a computer game. We we're going to be doing motion capture. I was like, okay. And it wasn't until I was in the room and then there was all these, uh, the, so it's based in Vancouver, EA Sports. All these Canadians were like, so we'll, we'll show you some footage now. And they showed us the footage and I'm going, uh, that's FIFA. That's definitely FIFA. And they turned it off and they're like, okay, so that's what's going to be happening. So that's what's happening in the scene, just so you know. And I was like, excuse me, is um. Is this an audition for FIFA? Like, oh, well, we, we can't really see. It's kind of types. I was like, okay, but that's definitely FIFA. Like, well, yeah, yeah, but we can't say it. Well, I was like, oh, mate, this is, this is FIFA, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> uh, and I think it's because I was probably so annoying and they were probably like, he'd be a good Gareth Walker. So <laughs> I don't know what the lesson is in that. Always be yourself, which is probably a bad character trait if I am Gareth Walker, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> and that, and and kind of like you're, you're almost like immortalized now, aren't you? Like you are, that is that is you. Like when you look at that post, they, they, they've done the motion capture and they've modeled it on yourself, haven't they? Yeah, I mean it, it's kind of bonkers, especially like because I'm not exactly a massive computer gamer or anything like that. Quite, I think, quite enjoy them sometimes. They're quite good escapism, I think, especially at the moment. Um, but FIFA is something that me and my brothers have always played. So to have to, to be immortalized like you say and plus it's amazing to have one up on my brother like that because he my brother joel he's incredible at fifa he beats me every time i think i beat him a handful of times in a whole lifetime um it is great to just go well you know i don't like bringing my work home just that you know but, well i am fifa that's quite a good excuse just to uh, just to hit him with 
And um, did you ever play the the journey? Did you ever play it? Like even though even though you knew the storyline and you knew how it was going to end out. Yeah. Yeah, and I remember the first time I played it, I was gutted because I was like, they have made me hobbit short. I was like, I am no way that short. My wife was like, mm, you are that short though. <laughs> that was quite funny. And I always kept trying to pass the ball to myself to score, but no matter what I did, you know, it was fixed for Alex Hunter. So you've played you've played in a variety of roles in Unforgotten Misfits, most recently Death in Paradise. Do you think it's important to, to have a set of transferable skills, not only as an actor, but that you can take into all different forms of life? Yeah, ab ab absolutely. And in, in keeping it, what I've learned for me, I think everyone's different, uh, is keeping it simple. Like, I take it back to like, even things like, uh, you know, you're doing like GCSE bite size, doing stuff like that, mm. like those, classic cliche analogies and it's like fish like gobbling it up but like all the bits of fish food and it's taking it at bite size and then they put all the different work and your know, different topics or whatever into that uh and keeping it simple i think is is super important and i still use that to this day you know because there's so much going on every time you get a job or for me getting a getting a role it's like okay well you know what's it going to be shown on who am i going to be working with you know, can I afford to do it? Is is the money good enough? Uh, okay, what what my character choice is going to be? And you can get um everything can get ahead of you before you've even started the job. Um, so I just keep it really really simple, and I just read it. I just read it, and then I read it, and I read it, and I read it, and without n actively knowing, it's already having an effect on me, and then I'm making a decision. Um you know, for my, for my future self without having to feel going, right, okay, what am I going to do here or what am I going to do there? Just read it, keep going over it and then let, you know, sort of like have a good night's sleep and then let all let it sort of come to me. Don't put the pressure on too soon before I've even stepped on set. Does that make sense? Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. I'm kind of thinking about kind of the current pandemic and, and where we're at with that how has that kind of affected your kind of either filming acting kind of directing stuff your day-to-day -day stuff oh halfway through season four of, of unforgotten mm. uh, and it was getting weirder and weirder by the day and you could tell everyone was getting more and more anxious because especially at that time we knew very very little about uh, about the virus so coming into work each day was just like, oh my God, what's going to happen? And then it was kind of a relief when we did stop filming. But obviously when that does stop, you, you immediately start to worry about money and, um, and providing for your family. I'm very fortunate in the sense, I mean, theatre is completely, you know, it's, it's completely obliterated at the moment. There are signs of shows being put in place, but it's, you know, it's, it's completely gone at the moment. Film and TV have adapted quite well. You know, it all stopped for the first lockdown. Um, but now they've managed to find a way of get things going again. And that, that's been a real, a real sort of grace and savior for myself. But my God, it's really tough. I did a gig in Berlin just before Christmas. Uh, and like we were wearing tags. And if anyone broke the two meter rule, you know, they'd go off. And then you're like, this is that is the last thing that I want to be thinking about when you're doing a when you're doing a scene. So, if honest, it it, it has killed it like the enjoyment a little bit. But at the same time, I'd rather be doing that than than no job at all. Like, have you got some sort of routine or anything to keep you mentally active, or anything you're listening to, watching to that keeps you mentally active? <sighs> yeah, it's my daughter. <laughs> she, she keeps me. She drives me mental. Um, but it's really good. She's she's in nursery three mornings a week now, and that's how sort of me uh, and my wife we sort of plan everything because we sort of have to work. I realise that when I start, and I'm sure you know we'll all sort of share similarities in this. If I start working on my own, it, I soon break down really quick. But as soon as I start leaning on my wife for things, or you know, my little in or putting time in there. <clears throat> things become a lot, a lot, lot quicker and a lot easier. And I try not to put, you know, at first, you know, we're all doing the exercise thing. We were all 
uh, going, right, okay, we need a routine, we need this and that. And then I think that can be equally as um, draining because it's sometimes just really hard to live up to those sort of goals and standards. So I just do a little bit of everything, try and do 20 minutes exercise a day, even if it's just a couple of push-ups or something like that in a bedroom. Um, and try not to take too much on at the moment because it's the world isn't functioning as normal. So I just try and, okay, set small goals. And if I achieve them, great. And then if I don't, I'm not, I'm, I try not to be too hard on myself because I, I can be quite hard on myself at times. And kind of um, talking about it in terms of being able to adapt yourself and, and kind of moving forward, you, you've made that kind of step from doing a bit in front of the camera and now starting to do a little bit behind the camera as well. So how have you found that, that shift doing a bit of directing now as well? Um, honestly, just nothing but pain. Right. Like, absolute pain because it's kind of like um, learning to do something again. And especially as you get older, it gets a, it gets a bit harder. You know, I'm nearly 33 at the end of the month. Um, <clears throat> I, you know, it's quite scary, you sort of feel quite vulnerable, uh, but the reward is amazing. Um, I'm not, I, don't, I wouldn't say I'm like the, the most, I'm not the smartest of blokes. Um, I just knew that there was something inside me that was like, I want to experiment with this. I want to see if I can do it. Uh, and I give a pat on my back to myself for the fact that I just chucked myself into it. And the reason it's been nothing but pain is because I've had to relearn a craft in a sense. And it's sort of been over the last, since 2017, so about four years, uh, I did a short film for BBC Wales for a little scheme called It's My Shout. And the short film won, uh, just to get the, uh, the script accepted, I was like, oh, okay, so maybe I've got something here that I can, I can work with. And the film went on to win an award. Uh, and, and then ever since then, I've not looked back, but every single time that I start a script or I start anything, it's not like, right, I've done it once. I know what we're going to do next time. Every time, um, it, it's just equally as hard, if not harder. Um, uh, it, it, does, it doesn't really get any easier, but I think that's part of the process as well. You, you know, you come up with this idea or this concept and it's like starting a business or anything like that. You've got this idea and it's just this big piece of clay. And then you just, you go, oh, I thought that was really good. Then you look at it and you go, oh, and then you start chiseling away at it and you just have to sort of form. And then you, then you sort of get closer and closer to what, you know, that original good feeling of that idea was. So in essence, it's, it's been nothing but pain, but when it does come off and you see like Lola, my short film, my debut, uh, that's been shown in the States now on Showtime, which is HBO's sister network. Uh, and that was just like, such a rewarding moment you know we started that concept back in 2018 and now only just the other day it just got released you know internationally so that was an incredibly rewarding moment talking about future rewarding moments um knowing you're a big Doncaster Rovers fan um unfortunately for so many people in the town were, were watching a legend bow out of his career at the end of the year in in I James Coppinger if it came about for you to sort of like direct a, a film or, or documentary on, on James Coppinger's career or, or life, what, is that something you'd, you'd jump at the chance to do? I think, I think we all would, wouldn't we? And it's so <laughs> funny you say that. I, you know, it, 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 it's been something I've been sort of thinking about. And I mean, uh, cops speak every now and again, just on Twitter, just pa pa you know, pass a message back and forth of like, well done or whatever. And I'm, I'm, it's so funny you say that. I don't know if it's like fate or whatever, but I have been, I mean, it's just such an amazing story. Like ev everyone can, you know, he, he's a lad who had everything at Newcastle, didn't he? Under Sir Bobby Robson, Alan Shearer was there at the time, Newcastle in the Premier League, so much promise. And, and you know, in Newcastle, I played for Newcastle, is like, doesn't get any better than that. And then Jamie's story, almost losing it all and then realising, no, this is what I want to do. And then the fight back and what he's achieved in the career and what he's done, it's, it's, it's so inspiring to, to fans, you know, from the club or just all around the world. So I think, I think someone's got to be done. Someone, someone will do it if I don't, won't they? 
Um, it's just I've got to try and work out a pitch and if I've got the bottle to present it or not. But yeah, that's that's got to be done. Back yourself, Lewis. I think you back yourself. I think. Yeah. All right. All right. I like your mindset around that and and the next question is looking at sort of more mental health and mindset and is mental health something that you as actors discuss because I can imagine like in the world of acting sort of everyone's like trying to fight their way to the top and and stuff like that is it is it something you discuss amongst each other though as in terms of a profession <clears throat> yeah I think so I think it's growing uh, in discussion in more recent years but it's it's quite a um it's quite a lonely profession in a sense you, you're constantly thrown into new people with di different works mm. and you have to make bonds very quickly but you know your agent sends you the script you learn the script and it's uh, peter o'toole used to say it's habitual um uh isolated study and that you know you're on your own constantly and you're forever rejected the amount of times that, you know, I speak to casting directors and directors and they go, oh my God, Lewis, that was amazing. That was brilliant. And you come out 10 feet high or whatever and you get the feedback on that, the brilliant, and then it's not gone your way. Um, so I think trying to navigate the mental hardships um, uh, of being an actor and becoming an actor is, it can be really, really tricky. Uh, and the way that I've sort of negated it, you know, you didn't, you, you can't at first, you've got all the hopes in the world and you're just getting pegged back and pegged back and pegged back. Uh, and I think only, I think I say to my wife and my mum, uh, probably about every eight months, I say, I'm going to pack it in. You know, I'm not doing this anymore. I have a big hissy fit. And then I have some food, I have a sleep. And I go, oh no, I'll, I'll keep going. Because it is so hard. Um, but the big difference that I've realised maybe first five years to the, you know, the most recent five years is um, just talking about it. And I think that's a really big thing in mental health. You know, a problem uh, shared is a problem halved. Mm. Um, and just going, oh my God, this is really hard. Um, just alleviates so much. It might not solve the problem or it might not do anything for you. But just talking about your issues can just literally change your day like that saying I'm really worried about this, I'm really worried about that, I didn't do that, I didn't do this, ultimately can just only ever sort of help take that weight off your chest. Um, and it can feel embarrassing and it can feel vulnerable at times. And, you know, we all want to go, you know, because actors constantly get, um, hi, mate, what are you up to at the moment? What are you doing? Or what have you been filming? And half the time you go in, uh just been sitting at home in my pants playing FIFA really actually there's nothing else going on and it's really tough because people always want to talk about because it it's an, such an exciting thing um but being honest um I think it only makes you more more human more relatable uh and it, it, it helps you know that's what I've found anyway personally oh, bro, does that feed into your kind of question Aidan yeah, when it does get tough, is there, is there a piece of advice that you always remember? Like, is there a piece of advice that's helped you get to where you are now and it's given you the opportunity to carry on? Um, yeah. I, well, it's maybe not a piece of advice, but it's something I discovered. And it's that no one, like, you could win an Oscar and it'd be like, whoa, all over Twitter and everyone would be going mental, be like, that's the best thing you've ever done and the next day no one really cares so no one really cares as much as you do so and that's you know it's great that you care that much and that you know you're really passionate about something but then also leave it at the door because there'll be other opportunities there'll be other roles the other things it's not life and death so put everything that you that you have into something but then leave it there leave it all on the pitch you know like you know if you're using a football analogy you go hell for leather for 90 minutes then you go home you have a bath and then you forget about it and then you're on to the next you know the next game or whatever and that's the biggest thing that i've sort of realized you know and that is win lose or draw as well you know whether you're you've had a really great game or you've had a really crap game they're both the same. They're both just a game. At the end of the day, they're in the past and then it's gone. Um, 
So as soon as you walked out of that audition room or as soon as you won that Oscar or whatever, that's done. I'm going home to my family or I'm going to go see my mates down the pub or I'm going to have a kick about in the park because those that actually fundamentally, we go to work and we follow our passions so we can enjoy life with our friends really. And that's that, That's the thing that I've, I've learned the most. Leave it at the door. Try not to, to, to bring it home with you, which is easily, uh, you know, more you know, said than done. But you know, that that's that's what I've learned. I was going to say you've talked about this already, where you've got to a lot of auditions and you get a lot of no's. It takes a, you know, and you obviously you'll get the yes, and and that's that's amazing. But you, how do you kind of pick yourself up all the time to? to go again to go for another audition and I think like you said parking then things that have happened and then moving on or drawing a line is really important isn't it yeah massively so um I mean it is I think it's that thing of like getting back on the horse and it's something that you just learn with age you just think oh my god the amount of times that I've seen people sitting in audition rooms just being like oh that is bad that is bad acting um you kind of just you got to laugh it off. Remember, it's not that important, uh, and just just get on to the next one. And I'll always be another opportunity, or whatever it may you know, whatever may come of this opportunity, I'll be another one down the corner, sort of thing. Yeah, exactly. And also, it's also like especially with acting, like say if you're not in the headspace, uh, I'm a firm believer of getting back on the horse. But sometimes, especially with mental health, if you're feeling really down and bloody hell, you just can't get you know, can't get up in the morning or, you know, struggling to just cook yourself, you know, some food or brush your teeth or do something simple, then park that then. Don't do that audition that day. Don't play that game that day. Don't put that pressure on yourself. Maybe just go, right, I'm going to get to the shops today. Yeah. I'm going to do that because I guarantee you, as soon as you're feeling better, then you'll be in a better headspace to go, right, next audition, we can crack on with that. Next job interview, then I can crack on. I've sorted myself out first. Think about the simple things. Um, that's what I saw. A quick story. I had an, a, a friend of mine told me the other day, there was a lady and she was seeing a therapist uh, and she was really bummed out. She's feeling really, really down in herself. Um, and the therapist said, why? And her honest thing, well, the therapist said, well, you know, what's the thing that you're worried about the most? And she felt quite embarrassed because the thing that she was worried about the most, she was like, if I go home and I have to wash the dishes one more time, I'm going to kill myself. This is, I literally can't do it. But she told him, um, and he said, well, you know, you know, go, go into that a bit more. And she said, well, the problem is I put the dishwashers in and, you know, uh, dishes in the dishwasher and, I, you know, I run it and then it's made, you know, take them out and then rinse them again. And it's, it's really stressing me out. And he just went, run it twice. And she went, oh, well, I don't, I, you're not meant to. And he says, well, who says you're not meant to? He says, just run it twice. Have a shy, shower laying down. Don't do what you think you should have to. Change your perspective. Do what, you know, lets you survive at this moment in time. And I think that's a really important story for me. I'm like, yeah, just do, just do what you need to to get on. Do you know what I mean? Don't always put that pressure on yourself. I just love that story. I just think it's an important one to... No, it's, yeah. It's so just to and move on to the next one and can you tell us like what you're currently working on and and what we can look forward to to watching so at the moment there's a lot of auditions which are which are really exciting but they're a pain in the ass because i have to do them in, from my house so i have to do like cell tapes and skype sessions which i'm just uh, so i'll probably never work again unless we get out of this pandemic um but what's keeping me busy is I direct. So we've got Lola, which just put on, literally, we just got onto the show time and that was, you know, so much hard work getting that done, sorting out that deal, which was amazing. Uh, and then I've just directed another short film called Harry the Hamster, um, which is a mixture of live action and animation. Um, so we're in post-production at the moment. Um, so it's my first um, time I've directed. Um, and oh, we've got visual effects, we've got animation. I've bitten off more than I can chew. So that's what I'm saying, it's, it's just paying constantly. So I'm constantly learning uh, and working with the, the animator at the moment, just trying to get it over the line because it is bloody hard. I'm like, why have I chosen to animate this hamster? 
Um, so that's what I'm doing. I'm spending about eight hours a day looking at this hamster. You said like you didn't, you can't really recall advice that's helped you throughout your career, but if you could go back and tell your younger self one piece of advice, knowing what you know now, what would it be? Um, oof, Aiden. Oof, okay. What would I tell myself? I don't know. We don't spend so much time in the pub, but then I had a pretty good time as well. So I'm not sure if I would say that. Um, <clears throat> I probably said, <laughs> this is a classic, isn't it? Don't worry. Try not to worry as much because it doesn't matter. You know, it really doesn't. But that is just such a cliche because it's like, well, I am worrying. I am really concerned about this thing. How do I not worry? Um, uh, and just to go back over previous points, and I think you do not, that. Maybe it's about not worrying about the little things, maybe. That might, might be. Yeah, because it all adds up. And I, I'm a person that's constantly putting far too much pressure on myself. Um, but just, you know, in, in, that, in those moments of stress or worry, you know, I think especially as blokes, we have this thing where we talk, it all gets a bit pent up and we don't let it out. Now, <laughs> nowadays, because me and my, my wife, um, we go to like couple therapy uh, and that really helps us communicate and it's been such a profound difference and through that I literally like walk into the kitchen sometimes and if things are worrying me I'm literally like um, so uh, India had this and that's my daughter uh, and um, it's made me feel this way uh, and I know I'm meant to talk about my emotions but I don't really know how to do this but this is how I'm feeling Ugh. and I sort of spit it out like that and it sounds really stupid but it just it, it just it does work because all of a sudden these things that were in my head or in my body are all of a sudden outside of them. And I actually, the knock on effect from that is I don't worry as much. So I suppose um, if I went back to my younger self, I'd say uh, try, try not to worry as much. And I'd probably put a bet on like Coppinger doing as many seasons as he did because then I'd be absolutely quids in, mate. <laughs> That's what I'd really do. Brilliant. And uh, and I can that that we've run out of time unfortunately, but it's been absolutely fantastic chatting to you, Lewis. Oh, really, amazing! You no, know, really do appreciate you coming on. Um, obviously, local lad, and, and we wish you all the success in the future. And we look out for that James Coppinger uh, documentary movie. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> I, I'm I'm li I'm literally I'm going to call Ryan Gosling after this, see if he fancies playing cops. Absolutely, that'd be class, wouldn't it? But yeah, thank yeah. you very much. Um, thank again, you. Cheers. Thanks so much for having me. Thank you. Cheers. Bye.